I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately, anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Oh, speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches, not the Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. By the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me. Eight bottles of champagne are in this happy meeting soon. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that in a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I've often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of the first rate brand. Good heavens, is marriage so demoralized as all that? Oh, I believe marriage is a very pleasant state, sir. Although I must admit, I've had very little experience with it myself. I've only been married once, and that was due to a misunderstanding between <laughs> myself and the other person. I don't know that I am much interested in your family life, then. Oh, no, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I rarely think of it myself. <laughs> very natural, I'm sure. That is your name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Vague views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders do not set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem as a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? <laughs> what brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth did you do that? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It's excessively boring. <laughs> <laughs> who are these people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Got nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. Then. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Shropshire? Uh, Yes, uh, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Merely Aunt Augusta. And Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that's all very well, but I'm afraid that Aunt Augusta won't quite prove to be being here. May I ask why? My dear Bella, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It's almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you would come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. Well, I don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love. But there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, what am I being accepted? It's <laughs> what you should be as I believe. Then the excitement is all over. You know, the very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I shall certainly try to get back. I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. <laughs> oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches! They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta! But you have been eating them all the time. Well, that is a different matter. She is my aunt, not yours. <laughs> have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is choked into bread and butter. <laughs> Perfectly good bread and butter it is, too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat at all. You act as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I didn't think you ever will be. <laughs> Why don't you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Them. Girls don't think it's right. Well, that is nonsense. This is not. This is a great truth. It 
counts the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees everywhere nowadays. In the second place, I can give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my honest cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you must first clear up this whole question of Cecily. Cecily? Mm -hmm. What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? Now, I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. You rang. <clears throat> Bring me the cigarette case that Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he died. Yes. <laughs> do you mean to say that you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you had let me know. i have been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. <laughs> well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There is no use offering a large reward now that the thing is found. I think that is rather mean of you, Modest, I must say. However, now that I look at the inscription inside, I see that the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. <laughs> oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should and should not read. Half of modern culture depends on what one should not be. <laughs> I'm quite aware of the fact that I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this is not your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said that you did not know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt, yes. Charming old lady she is too, lives in Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algie. But why does she call herself Little? If she's your aunt, it lives in Tunbridge Wells. From little Cecily, with her fondest love. My, my dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is, surely a matter or not may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. Sir, for heaven's sake, give it back to me, Algie. <laughs> but why does your aunt call you her uncle? <clears throat> From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear Uncle Jack. There's no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. To my aunt, no matter what her size may be, she call her own nephew her uncle. I can't quite make out. <laughs> Besides, your name is Jack Tall. It's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. <coughs> you have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most <laughs> earnest looking person I ever saw in my life. <laughs> it's absurd to say your name isn't our Ernest. It's on all of your cards. Here is one of them. <clears throat> Mr. Ernest Worthing before the Albany. I shall keep this as proof that your name is Ernest if ever you attempt to deny it to me. Or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else there. Well, uh, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that is not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come on, boy, you had much better have the thing out at once. <laughs> my dear Algy, you sound exactly as if you were a dentist. It's a very vulgar thing to sound like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. This is a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now, go on. I want to know the whole thing. I may mention that I've always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I'm quite certain of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth is a Bunburyist? I will reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. <laughs> Here it is. Now produce your explanation and spray. Make it improbable. My dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's quite ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Carr, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me and his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Carr. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Brizzo. Uh, where 
is this place in the country? By the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You will not be invited. I may tell you candidly, the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bumpered all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you earnest in town and jack in the country? My dear fellow, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in a position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It is one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, dear Algie, is the whole truth, pure and simple. Oh, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if to either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't at all be a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should think that to people who have not been at a university. They do it so well in the daily papers. <laughs> no, what you are is a bumperist. I was quite right in saying you were a bumperist. You are one of the most advanced bumperists I know. What on earth do you mean? <clears throat> you have admitted a very useful younger brother called Ernest. In order that you might be able to come up to town as often as you like, I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down to the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it were not for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I would not be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's, for I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. <laughs> I know you are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I have the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dine there on Monday. Once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. <laughs> In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I am sat down as a member of the family and sat down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know precisely who she will set me next to tonight. She will set me down with Mary Barker, who flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it's not even decent. That sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. <laughs> Yes, but do be serious about it. I hate people who are never serious about real 
shallow up there. <laughs> Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I do hope you've been behaving very well. I've been feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two rarely go together. Dear me, you are small. Well, I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. <laughs> oh, I hope I'm not that. You need no room developing me, I intend to develop in many directions. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, Algernon, if I was poor if we were a bit late. But I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harper. Why, I haven't seen her since her poor husband's death. I've never seen a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger now. And now, Algernon, I will have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches she promised me. And certainly, Aunt Augusta. <laughs>
Call me Dave, just being Miss Fairfax. Pray, don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Wen. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. That makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. <laughs> I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracco's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I've often had to speak to her about. Miss Prism. I'm sorry, Miss Fairfax. Ever since I met you, I've, I've admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. <laughs> yes, I am quite well worth the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you have been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines, and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been philosophy. The name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. <coughs> when Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. Really <laughs> love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own eyes. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. <laughs> but your name is Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. But supposing it was something else. Do you mean to say that you couldn't love me then? Well, that is clearly metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of your life as, as we know them. Well, personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It's a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs>
you smoke? Well, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. <laughs>
need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would advise you, Mr. Wedding, to acquire some accumulations as soon as possible, and to find one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. <laughs> I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment if it is in my dressing room. <laughs>
brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? Oh, that's all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She has a capital appetite, goes on long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. <laughs> I should rather like to see Cecily. <laughs> I can take very good care that you never do. She is excessively pretty and only just 18. Well, have you told Gwyndon yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? <laughs> oh, one doesn't blurt these things out to people. Gwendolyn and Cecily are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I bet you anything you like that half an hour after they've met, they will be calling each other sister. Women only do that after they have called each other a lot of other things. <laughs> 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 what shall we do after dinner? Go to the theater? Oh no, I loathe listening. Well, uh, we could go to the club. Oh no, I hate talking. <laughs> we might trot round the empire, Tim. Oh no, I can't bear looking at things. It's so silly. <laughs> what shall we do then? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> However, I don't mind hard work so long as there is no definite objective of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. 
Oh, I love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. <laughs> <laughs> nonsense, Algy. You're never talking anything but nonsense. No one ever does. <laughs> <laughs> I only know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. <laughs> Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commanded one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. I will marry him to triviality but be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know German and geology. And things of that kind influence a man very much. Indeed. Oh, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so shall he reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter all the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. <laughs> I believe memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novel, Cecily. <laughs> I wrote one myself in the younger days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor. A classical illusion, Mary. Rotten pagan office. 
I will see you both, no doubt, at evening song. I think, dear doctor, that I will have that stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all. <laughs> <laughs> We may go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. <laughs> Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the ruby you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. <laughs> Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. <laughs>
Mr. Mistress, Mrs. Short sighs his own thing. You are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prison said that all the looks are snared. They are snared at every sensible man. Oh, I don't think I should like to catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, indeed, advisable. Our weather is so changeable. 
Uh, what hour would Mr. Sandwin inform? Oh, I might trot round about five, if that would suit you. Oh, perfectly, perfectly. I have two similar cases to form at that hour. A case of the twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages. Poor Jenkins, the carter. The most hardworking man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. Admirably, <laughs> admirably. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not shoot any further into a house of my own. I merely ask you be not too much bowed down by grief. What seemed to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. Seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. <laughs>
back in no time. <laughs> Little County 
Sunday newspaper sure to chronicle the fact next week. <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. I feel there must be some slight errors for you. <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the morning post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> If you would care to verify the incident, pray. So. <laughs> I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. <laughs> <laughs> Married 
to this young lady? The dear little Cecily, of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you, you bet. I knew there must be some mistake, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present around your waist is my dear guardian, Mr. John Worthy. <laughs> 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 Yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill wasn't hereditary. 
cemetery. It used to be, I'm sure, but I dare say it is now. <laughs> Science is always making wonderful improvements. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nonsense, Algy. You always talk nonsense. Jack, you were at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. There are only two left. <laughs> but I hate tea cake. <laughs> and why on earth do you allow it to be served up for your guests? <laughs> what ideas you have about hospitality? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you here. Why don't you go? <laughs> well, I haven't quite finished my tea yet. <laughs> Where question 
actions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. <laughs> <laughs> Markby, 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 a firm of the very 
very highest position of their profession. Indeed, I am told one of the Mr. Motley's is to occasionally be seen at dinner parties. So far, I'm satisfied. Oh, extremely kind of you, Lady Bradwell. I have also in my possession, you will be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth. Baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles, both the German and the English variety. <laughs> ah, a lot crowded with incident, I see. Though perhaps a little too exciting for a young girl. I never approved the premature experiences. <sighs> Gwendolyn, the time has come for our departure. We have not another moment to lose. But as a matter of form, Mr. Webbing, I had better ask you if this card you has any little fortune. Oh? About a hundred and thirty thousand pounds in the funds, that is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell, so please oh, be seen here. Oh, yes, Mr. Webbing. A hundred and thirty thousand pounds. And in the funds. Miss Cardew is a very attractive young lady, now that I really look at her. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. He's not Zonian. I fear there can be no possible 
doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank. I've just been informed by my butler an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brut 89. A wine I was specially reserving for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
Yes, here is the injury received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger, happier days. <laughs> and here is the stain on the lining, and that was caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, Colonel Livington. And here on the lock are my initials. I'd forgotten that in an extravagant mood I'd had them placed there. <laughs> yes, the bag is undoubtedly mine. It is a delight to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It's been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Mother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> I come from the past that you could have no name. It is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. <laughs>